Hello, everybody. Amanda is not here today. I'm Dr. Bossi for Essence Podcast. I have two special guests today, uh, Paul and uh, Anjum. Um, uh, one of us is in the United States, but two of us are in Germany. And I want you uh, just introduce yourself, uh, who you are, what you do, and what uh, took you to Germany. Because today we are going to talk about how is to live as an immigrant in Germany, which uh, I think we have stories that we want to share you. Please, uh, uh, Paul, go ahead. Hi, my name is Paul, uh, Shristi Mangal Paul, and I've been living in Germany for seven years now, so it's a long time. And I came to Germany as a very starry-eyed 19-year-old girl, you know, dreaming of becoming a doctor. And I came after Brexit happened uh, because I just wanted to get away from England. So, see, I mean, I'm Indian. I have Caribbean roots, but I grew up in England. So I'm quite European in that sense of the way. But when I came to Germany, I uh, definitely had the cultural shock of my life, which I still continue to have seven years on. And I work as a journalist in Deutsche Welle. And it's a huge honor to be here with Dr. Abbasi and joining my fellow guests today to talk about life in Germany. <laughs> yeah. And Anjum, what about you? What, what's your background on this? Um, I'm Dr. Farhan Jum. I am now currently doing my residency in neurosurgery program and I get a chance, I would say, or big opportunity in my life in 2013. So it is now almost 11 years now. I am in Germany. Um, the chairman of World Federation of Society, Dr. Majid Sami, uh, was once in Bangladesh for a meeting and that one thing makes wonder to him that there is no female in neurosurgery, whereas we do have some female neurosurgeons who decided to leave the country. So on that time, currently on the training, I was the only female and I think he got the right uh, track that he understand that um, I should grow uh, in other country where the women are more welcome or they are more privileged to finish the training as a safe woman. So he invited me and after three months, uh, I was in Germany and from then till now, I never visit my country and I'm staying in Germany. Yeah. Now we are going to talk about how to be an immigrant in Germany. I immigrated to Germany in 1987, and I left Germany in 1999. So my, my experience is a little old, but your both your, your experience are fresh. It is how, Deutsch, how Germany or Deutschland is now. And uh, I can tell you from my own experience that um, it is uh, the title I chose is for a reason how to be an eternal immigrant in Germany, that there is something about the culture that um, it is a big hurdle to join it. And when I left Germany 25 years ago, I was hoping that uh, by the time my kid, my children grow up in Germany, the situation will be different. But now I wanna hear from you. I wanna open the floor to you. So you said it was a cultural shock to you, pal. Tell me a little more detail. I want to hear it uncensored about what you know. You grew up, yes. You, you, if you grew up in um, in England, you are culturally European, but you are talking about the cultural shock. I want to know all the details. Please go ahead. So you see, Germany is a tough country, and Germany is um, very individualistic. So if you grew up in a country where it's more collectivistic and the society holds together, the first thing when you come to Germany, you notice is you are on your own. You don't have a community, especially if you come here as a young immigrant and you don't know the language as well. You don't speak it. You don't know people. The first thing you want to do is you find your people. You want to establish yourself. You want to ensure you have a roof over your head. You know, you have food, you have amenities, and it's a very peaceful country. Back when I came, I felt it was peaceful and I got opportunities right off the bat. Not going to lie about that. But why it was so difficult is because um, I'm a very outgoing, garrulous person by the nature that I am, because that's what, you know, English culture is like. 
I'll give you the simplest example. Picture you in a pub, right? If you go to a pub in England, you'd walk in and you talk to the next stranger sitting to you. There's no bounds. You don't have to sit alone and drink. You talk to your bartender. You talk to anybody who's, you know, on the pub floor. Really, it's all yours. If you go to Germany, if you don't go with a group, you will drink alone. If you don't know people already, you will sit alone in utter lonesomeness and enjoy your beer in peace. Nobody will bother you and people will expect you. Don't bother anybody. That is the simplest uh, you know, description I could give you of Germany in a nutshell. Such a perfect description. Um, did you speak German before you went to Germany? Not quite as well. When I came, I had done a very intensive nine-month course from Goethe Institute, and I did it in India because it was cheaper back then. So when I came here, I spoke very basic German. I could order a beer. I could go to the market and say, mit Karte bitte, mit, mit card, please. That was it. Yeah. And then I went to study in a university, and everything was in German. And the first cultural shock I felt, I was, you know, oh, I'm the only foreigner here. They're going to accept me with open arms. I'm going to be everybody's friend. But turns out it's a group of people who know each other from back in high school. Somebody knows them, you know, their friend's circle from nursery school. And then you show up fresh off the boat and you don't have a group and people won't let you in. So you need the help. People don't give you the help. It's not that they refuse. They just don't know how. Now, I think one of the first cultural shock, shock I got is that even in the language, the difference between do and z. You know, you want to explain to us what that really distinction is and uh, in German language, how that works? Because most of people who speak English, they wouldn't understand that. So I think, um, Andrew, you would know a lot of languages like French, Hindi, um, even German. They have a formal form and the informal form, the C form and the do form. So the first thing you learn about in Germany is when you go for a meeting for your workplace, you ask the person, wollen wir sitzen oder duzen? So every time a person says do, because everybody wants to feel young and informal. But the fact of the matter is, even if you see, I prefer Zitzen because the distance is there between the person I'm talking to and me. So I'd rather the distance be there even when I'm using the do form, because fact of the matter is I could say do a basi and, and we're still not friends. We're still strangers. And the distance between us is, you know, as you know, I'm in Germany and the USA, and that's the amount of distance you have here. But that is interesting now, because at my time, you wouldn't even ask that. You would z use the Zitzen, you would use the Z, the formal form. That would be an insult, meeting somebody and even asking Solomon's Dutzen or the Zitzen. That would be an insult then. So I, I feel that is might be not enough, but maybe something culturally going in the right direction that you are even allowed. It's acceptable socially to to ask that question. So, um, Anjum, tell me about your background, you know, when you arrived in Germany. Did you speak German before? Um, I just complete what was necessary to get the visa. So it was only B1 level, but honestly, it was on the paper. But practically, I can't speak and I can't write because it was just to pass the exam. On that method, it's like I just grab all the words to pass. And when I come, then it was totally new for me. But I think I am that time also blessed and still now I am blessed that I get to know a very nice family. Um, the lady was criminal police who uh, let me get a room which was very close to the hospital. But uh, I think with the language, I always have the difficulty. Mm, but I think I was a little bit smart. So I didn't show uh, people that I don't understand. Mostly in the hospital, like I got six months of attachment with Professor Manjit Sami. It is actually my privilege and honor at that age to meet with such a magnificent man. Um, so... I was smiling and I was nodding. Uh, even I was actually getting the body language and the tone of the voice that mm. what might be. I can read the images. That was my interpretation in my work life. Yep. That how I managed. Yeah, what and was the cultural is, shock? I want to understand what was about the culture that mm. came in and said, wow, that is so different. 
What well, do you can? Is there any specific experience you can share? I think I understand that how to live alone, and that I think it's also within my personality that when I see that one turmoil or something is pulling me down then somehow I make it other way around. I, I try to come up. It is my personal, uh, maybe a uh, static. So uh, the thing goes um, like this, that this isolation or how Paul also said so clearly and so nicely that you need your group, otherwise you will be always isolated. So the beauty of being isolated, I use for reflect back on me. And I, I, I find the power within me here that actually I have all the answers. So I really appreciate that. I will don't say loneliness, but I will say that that solitude bring me back to me where I have all the answer. So in this journey, um, being um, alone, not knowing any human being in Germany, no relatives, no language, but I have to manage my life. Uh, parallelly, I have to go to the hospital and um, in the evening I go with a cycle to learn the language. I have to cope up with the winter. Uh, I don't have winter jacket. I don't have winter boots. So uh, manage everything. Um, I think makes me who I am today, but now also in this achievement of my life, um, when I look back, then I just think that, um, do I lose myself or I find myself? Yes. So I am a little bit uh, in between, but I think that it's a totally different version of me whom I used to know me. So this culture make me a um, total different person in a better way to survive in this world. But maybe in the midway, I, I lose myself. Well, that's a very emotional, uh, you know, uh, observation there, Paul. Um, I hear from everybody I know in Germany, being alone is a big, uh, a big thing in Germany as immigrant. Being alone until, um, even when I was there, is uh, it's about uh, one of my friends used a word that still resonate with me. He called Germany the green desert. Now, tell me about, you know, you came there, you start, you know, you, you described it going to a, 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 you know, Kneipe to get a beer and so on. How did you end up connecting to people? What was, I, tell, tell me about your first six months in Germany. I want to have a good description of your first six months in Germany, because that is probably the hardest time anybody will have. Go ahead. It's a very strong question, and um, I have a lot to say there. But first of all, Anjum, I'll tell you, the best person to have a conversation in Germany with is yourself. And uh, I started talking to myself because I had nobody else, and I realized I'm a very interesting person. <laughs> <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. So the first six months in Germany for me were very tumultuous. I was... Um, it's very hard to say uh, on a podcast, but I didn't find accommodation. So I slept in the Frankfurt Hauptbahnhof for seven days. So I was homeless for seven days when I came to Germany. And today I wear it as a badge of honor. You know, how many people can say I've survived the main central Frankfurt station? Not many. When I came here, I was alone. My parents were quite supportive, but they didn't know how this country worked. And I rebelled and I came. And I had bureaucratic problems, visa problems, monetary problems, finding housing was a problem. Everything came together and crumbled upon me. And for some very twisty turn of events, the house that I had rented turned out to be a scamster. So I did not rent any house and I just lost a lot of money. So my idea is now after seven years where I know everything about German law, and when people come to me for advice, I can cite them the book, Strafgesetz book, this Gazette's book. Being an immigrant is taking a huge risk. 
And when you go step into a country like Germany who have laws and the laws have bylaws and the bylaws have bylaws, not knowing what you're doing can land you in trouble. And the problem is if you land yourself in trouble, who's going to save you? There's nobody coming to bail you out. So I was 19 years old, alone, high winter time, also without a winter jacket on a Frankfurt Central Station, where hungry, very hungry, and uh, somebody showed kindness and said, you know what, um, you can sleep, or you can sleep in this thing they have for homeless people. And that is how my story started. So now when I go back to Frankfurt as, a, as an established journalist and I present shows, I'm very proud of myself because although this country threw bricks at me, I managed to take those bricks and build a house out of it. But not a lot of people managed to do that. And I know you were telling me you were here in the 90s. Back then, Germany was not used to having immigrants. The thing with immigration started 2015 onwards when Angela Merkel said, you know what, let's get those refugees in here. And ever since then, I feel Germany has changed because people have not, not only have the immigrants not gotten used to Germany, Germany has not gotten used to us. And that has resulted in this tension. And you can see in the politics, you know, the rise of far right, AFD winning in East Germany, a very far right party. Our future is not secure. And I don't know. It's like I've not come and I've not arrived in Germany yet. I don't know if I'm, I belong here. Now, if I may say, German had a lot of immigrant from 1960s when all the Turkish people came, but it was just the, mostly just the Turks. And they were so compartmentalized, meaning they were in certain areas just by themselves. They had their own street and so on. So you're absolutely right. There weren't that many, there were lots of immigrants, but they were completely outside of the German culture. They were like, almost like, a, I would say ghettos. Like you go yeah. up certain streets in Berlin, there's all Turkish. They don't speak even German. And, but they were forced to that corner. I think what happened in 1990s is that um, people came from all over the places, not from just the Turkish war as a gas arbiter, meaning the gas worker. And they wanted to be part of their society, but then they noticed it's not as easy. Now, you came in, you don't know anybody. And again, you notice that the, there's a group of German, I would say, Germans are, um, I, I had the same experience, you know, that I came here, I know nobody. Um, I, and there are lots of people, I at that time, I wasn't uh, prepared for that. I would say, what is wrong with these people? But then <laughs> within, within that group of people, you find few people, you have the feeling they are so good people that yeah. you, you have to make it up for the rest of them. Yes. You can't say in a handful of people, they take you in, they take care of you, they, um, you know, and there, uh, they, they, there's a small group of German that you connect, and there's, I'm still, after 30 years, I'm still, 40 years, I'm still connected to them. So, you come in, you establish yourself, you have a place to stay. Tell me about that first six months, because you went, that sounds like really traumatic for you, what I hear there. You can't, especially being homeless in Germany is uh, especially, yes, you should be carried as a badge of honor. I want to know, more. there are lots of details I want to know about that. If you feel comfortable sharing, please go ahead. So I realized I was out of a place one month in when I was in Germany. The place I had rented belonged to somebody with dementia who was not there. And so I find out I'm, you know, I have nowhere to go. I don't have a bank card. I have limited amount of cash, which I've already spent in renting a wrong place. I don't have a SIM card and I'm 19 years old and I'm a woman who doesn't speak the language in this country. Now, Frankfurt is quite international and you would see a lot of faces, which I thought, hey, they look like me, you know, but people are so, you know, you don't look into people in need. And Frankfurt is such a fast moving city. Everybody walks past you. I remember hunger. Because, you know, you grow up in a very comfortable middle class home, you've got food, you've got everything, but a warm bread, and then you're on your own, you know. So I remember I went to Yorma's and the little stores in Frankfurt Hauptbahnhof, and when you buy coffee, you get these small milk capsules. And I used to get those to eat because I, had, I hadn't the money. So after that 
part was over, I enrolled myself in pre-med and I realized even that was a hurdle. You have to register yourself. So many things they don't tell you about, you know, the hidden uh, steps in bureaucracy, which I wish they did. Because a lot of people who came there, especially from countries like Syria, Afghanistan, had just fled war. And you fled war to come back uh, and go to Ausländerbehörde and go through that headache again. I would go back, you know. Um, there has to be so much more support given to people like those, you know. Most of them come here after a traumatic experience. And the first thing they hear is you have to fill out this form, this form, you have to stand in line there. Everything is in the 90s. Nothing is digitalized. And they don't even take card payment here, which is quite surprising, which is the most surprising thing for me. But these are smaller things. The biggest hurdle, I think, in Germany is, which most migrants complain about, I complain about, is that you cannot talk to the local people about your problems. They think you're making it up. They think you're being a crybaby. You should be happy you're getting to live in a first world country. You're getting a job. You know, you have electricity, you have running water. Why are you complaining about this? This is basic human requirement, you know, to have people to talk to, to have a community. Yeah. I, I could live without a toaster. Yeah. <laughs> now, there is a word in German for refugee. Um, um, it's called yes. Azul, right? Is it still being used, that word Azul or Azul Bewerber? Very much so and negatively. Right now I work in the media and the moment you have the word Azul, Flüchtling, Migrant, you know there's a huge sticker on your head saying I'm not wanted here. And there's two different words you use in Germany. One is expat, which comes when you have white skin and you come from a European country or the global North countries. And if you look something like me or Dhaka, then you are an, uh, you know, an Auslander, which I think is a more general term for describing all of us here. And that term doesn't leave you. It really sticks to you. And no matter even if you speak German flawlessly, you pay your taxes on time, you wear a suit and tie and go to work and behave like a good boy, that term will be disadvantageous to you, your career, and even if you have children growing up here. I speak to a lot of people who are biracial, who have one, you know, one parent is German, one parent is not German. And they tell me, pal, you know what? I hate when they call me an Auslander, a foreigner. I was born here. I grew up here. I am a German person. But because I look slightly different than what is really, you know, this perception of Nordicness, which is completely bogus. Germany has been a very international country for hundreds of years. You don't see Germans having blonde hair and blue eyes. That's a myth. Germany has always been a very mixed uh, country with people from different cultures. And when I sometimes see the rhetoric going on in politics right now, and I hear people like Alice Weidel and Bjorn Hocker, who are far-right politicians talk, I'm like, immigrants built your country, dude. Those Gastarbeiter, those guest workers from Turkey, Greece, they built your economy. And I am paying more taxes than most German youth my age here. And it is very true about the... the... Uh, this movement of bringing those, you see, they went to those countries and they asked them to come to Germany. And you're absolutely right. They came because they were invited, but they were invited to come from the beginning to come build the economy and go back. Exactly. But you cannot do that to people. You cannot just bring them, let them build a future, let them build a home. And then once you don't need them, just send them back. Now, Anjum, tell me about your first six months. You know, I know that you came in a more orderly way, like you were invited to come to be in a hospital. And I, I love the thing, story you say, you pretended to understand more <laughs> than you did, because I think I, at least you recognize that. What, what I thought is that I really thought I am understanding it, what they are talking about, but I, I didn't really. But your recognition that you don't understand it, that's already one, ahead, one step ahead of me. But, you know, in medicine, especially in medicine, communication is extremely important. Tell me about your first six months being among this. By the way, for anybody who doesn't know that, medicine in Germany is like military. You get, you get court-martialed if you do the simplest thing. So it is not like in many other jobs that, 
you can get away with this and that. And as a matter of fact, for people who don't know that, the whole discipline, all of the surgeon in Germany used to be Prussian, Prussian uh, uh, officers. And that's where the, the military structure is transferred to medicine. So when you go to, uh, and uh, Paul, I hope you never have it at your work, but being yelled at in a German hospital in my time, that was a normal thing. Putting, uh, being put in a corner and being, you know, like, you know, uh, talked down and then being in your face and uh, uh, destroying, uh, uh, you know, self-confidence, that was part of being a doctor. So, yeah, <laughs> that, and that is a typical German thing because I don't believe anywhere else you get that. So, you, okay, you come at uh, the Anjum, you go to a hospital from all places. I don't know the culture in the hospital you went, but I want to hear from you. What was the, the interaction like to be in a hospital in Germany the first six months? Tell me. Okay, so I just want to assure you that uh, nothing changed from 90s. Um, shouting on the residents, um, even someone is standing 10 meters away from you, or maybe two meters, doesn't matter. Or you are in the same room with your 50 other nurses with whom a resident should work 24 hours um, to shout, to show the power as the over arts that um, he is superior to me having a consultant post uh, is still there, sir. So <laughs> I can just assure that, yes, I, I feel the same pain in my bones. Um, so honor to that uh, thing. Um, when I come to the hospital, um, before I was already worked three and a half years in Bangladesh, but my both neurosurgeon by whom I was trained was from India because I was working in a private um, hospitals. And uh, for my background, I study in Armed Forces Medical College because my father, who is passed away this year, February, used to be in as a colonel. So on that oh, privilege, I get also a scholarship and I study in Armed Forces Medical College. So that might be make me psychologically more uh, stress resistance, but was not enough <laughs> to be in Germany or to get the first wave. Um, so in hospital, the technology doesn't um, make me that, wow. No, I already saw um, intraoperative MRI. Yes, some things make me um, very stonish like, um, brain lab what is that lab what happened there i never heard of that term so i i learned uh neuro monitoring oh wow one can monitor something even surgeon is operating or awake craniotomy those terminology is and to observe those operation through such a magnificent man was a privilege and always like I'm visiting the Louvre Museum in a very fast time. It was always like what surprise I'm waiting on the next day. So uh, that part is uh, very interesting to look at an observer. But I am actually a keen observer. So I was always looking at the faces of the nurse when in the morning or like the culture of greeting is not so common from where I am coming from. Even though I have a military cultural training, I know how to use the utensil when I sit in the table, but I don't have that greeting culture that when you go to the operation theater, you should say, hey, I am Farhan Jum, I'm coming from Dhaka, and I'm a trained neurosurgeon, and now I'm here for observing. So hello to the nurse and the OT, that system, I don't have neither in my hospital, neither uh, in my practice. So people is looking at me and they are expecting something and nobody's talking with me. Like it was not so nice. I was thinking, okay, someone should take me in the corner and talk with me eye to eye. That you know, Farha, like a doctor maybe at my age. Hey, you know, Farha, mm -hmm. when you should go, like, you know, like a knee shake and say, hey, you should introduce yourself. And, you know, four times, five times, when they are happy, till then you should introduce yourself. 
simple thing can make my life so easy but how paul also said there is no one to help you there is nobody will gonna tell you hey buddy do that but i'm sure everybody go through the same stair um the thing is also one thing in the hospital hierarchy is very much yes i am aware of that because of my military background that doesn't hurt me much uh, but i observe people's body language and behavior and tone and i think um i'm very keen observer on that so with that i how they look i was just like praying to god almighty that the word like auslander it becomes like for me maybe i heal now after 11 years that the word doesn't bother me much but once in a while i was just thinking should i make a tattoo i'm not azul bevarba like <laughs> you know i am as ishmin yastin what should i do i am a doctor or i'm not like don't use that word um, yep. um but the german culture uh, what make life easier one message i want to give that this is a culture where you have to integrate it is not like us it is not like uk that you can come and order your curry from anywhere no my dear you come here you should learn the language you should you should find your way to survive in the winter and all those cold mask faces what gives you a signal are people are alive or all are dead zombies get used to that how fast you can get used to life will be easier this is a culture of integration it is not like you just live your life how you want then you will be end up your life like a turkish ghetto sorry i'm using that word but i think it is not the culture one one homework if i did from my house then my life will be easier but nobody teach me that that what is the culture one person should know the pattern of a culture so anjum you are I... just and i think what you are describing what i take out there that they are technologically very advanced but they have they have shitty manners for the rest of the world it works in germany though like the body language you were talking about there are certain things you don't see in us or anywhere else for matter of work like you go to a let's put it this way you go to a place to store to buy something you are going there to give them your money to get something and as soon as you ask your second question i, I mean at least in my time they are offended what do you want from me you know that, that the person is going to take your money give you something like customer service is like are you kidding me i'm here to give you money <laughs> So I'm asking you the second question and you're annoyed by me asking you question to shop here and so on. I don't know if it's still like that there or not, but their body language, they show you they're annoyed of they just they have to deal with you. Even in exactly. things that think it is they should be happy that you're their customers. Is it still like that there? it is it still exist even now on my uh, i don't know i am now licensed doctor so i think my journey is quite good enough that's why i'm still working in neurosurgery department and uh, like e e every day i have more than 30 patients and i'm communicating even private or government i don't mind uh, so i think my professor feels safe to let me handle his patient uh, in that language proficiency even uh, i see discrimination in between the nurses in between the patients or even when i am out of my uniform even in the road discrimination is everywhere i try because i i have to survive myself i i really love myself or i start to love myself so now i try to ignore but how i said i am keen observer i am a surgeon i should observe and ignore is difficult for me um Paul, tell me about your your daily experience. Like you know, um, and that is one of the reasons I think you had the, you made the right decision to get out of medicine, because <laughs> in medicine, I, we just talked about that. You, they would. Uh, have you watched any of these American movies with the drill sergeant yelling at the? <laughs> the have you seen that? No. Yeah. 
Le- yeah. Full leather jacket or full metal jacket. Full metal yeah, jacket. Something like yes. That. yes. Yeah. <laughs> there is a scene there that he's talking down and the idea there is actually pro- Prussian, breaking them down to rebuild them. But most of the time in Germany, they just break you down and then leaving you in pieces. They never- Exactly. Build they you. forget to build. They forget to rebuild you. Now, that is yes. what I think naturally you recognize that's not for you because that culture that break people down and then doesn't rebuild them, what I notice is that in medicine is a very, very common. But so you saved yourself, uh, Paul, from that culture. But what about your daily, you go shopping, you go to movie theater, you go to a, a, any random you know, government offices and so on. And they don't even, they, they are in your face. They are like, um, you know, at least in a, in a bar, they leave you alone. But then when you want something from them and how they behave toward you, can you describe a few of your experiences there? First of all, coming back to, you know, I can't speak about the medical field. I did work as a psychologist. I'm working as a journalist. And my observation is that workplaces in Germany are changing. The, the thing is, the older generation, which used to be this drill sergeant and scream at you and break you down and not put the pieces back together, they are retiring. They are off the force. But the younger generation who are coming now, they realize mental health is a real thing. And you can't just abuse people publicly and get away with it. Whenever I've worked with you know older Germans who come from the old school style of I'm your boss so I can you know deal with you the way I like, no insubordination. I have been yelled at. And what I did is I just left that organization, no buys, no sorry, Tata, I've got my rights. And I think the younger generation, which I am really proud to be a part of, is driving a positive change when it comes to work ethics and building a positive work environment. That's one good thing about Germany. But the thing that um, I still haven't gotten used to is nobody in your office actually is Germany wasn't a hypocritical place let's put it like that Germans were known for being honest they were transparent what a German said to your face they meant it but now I've noticed it's no longer the case because it's it, the society has gotten very politically correct you see in the front every German young person who's gone to university embodies the value of you know Oh, it's a very mixed society. We are very open to foreigners. There's no racism. There's no anti-Semitism. There's no Islamophobia. Everybody's welcome. It's a kumbaya society. It looks very nice on paper, but it's a very difficult ideology to put in practice. And that is where the most failings are happening. That's what I saw. Because even though these people are very keen on, you know, welcoming everybody, telling everybody you matter, they can't execute this. And that is where most foreign people who come here get the, get this shock. You know, I was thinking this is going to be, this is a young place. Everybody's hip and everything. You know, everybody's drinking fancy lattes. But the moment I said something wrong or I don't know something, I am put in a box and I'm labeled a very ignorant person. And that is destroying the modern German workplace. The fact that you have to be very, very careful about what you say, you have to walk on eggshells. And for example, If you work in a German office and your German worker, your colleague catches you not separating garbage correctly. So if you drink a cup of tea, the tea bag, the remnants of the tea leaves will go in the bio mood, which is the biodegradable stuff. The paper goes in the paper part, the plastic goes in the plastic part. Now, if you came from a country which doesn't do that, you have to be taught that. You're not going to come and Google it. How do I really discard garbage, you know, dispose of garbage? So nobody taught us and we got caught doing the wrong thing. I chucked it off like that in the bin and I got the scolding of my life. My Indian grandmother hasn't scolded me like that. Wow. We learn it in German class. Uh, in German <laughs> school, they teach us um, and even they give us garbage and they do that, um, that learning by doing that. Uh, we have to go through that and everything. But, but the idea that you come there and you must know all of that before you come there. Yes, that's how far I said that I didn't did my homework. I take all the blame by myself because 
my parents or neither my fourth generation even think to come to Germany or to be neurosurgeon. Yes, my sister is also a doctor or I have civil doctors in my country or my family. The thing is, nobody dare to come to Germany. There are very few Bangladeshi doctor who came to Germany or who is working. Now I can proudly say that. Um, so there is no um, like followers. If I will plan for UK, I have thousands of colleagues um, who can show me the way that is the exam. That's how you should do and that. But in Germany, first of all, there is no clear cut law or no clear cut statement because of the bureaucracy or because, because of their political issue, the change when they want, when the change is needed. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that is no clear cut um, communication is there. In one way, they maintain the clear cut communication, the parking signal or how Paul also very good, very clearly explain about the garbage. It is clearly mentioned blue, and uh, Gelbasa, uh, like yellow bag and the uh, bio and everything, green tone and everything. But on the other side, um, the main thing, the decision of wife or uh, what is the documentation or how to read a documentation or very strange one thing I remember now, German school start with German language. It's, there is nobody will gonna tell you, we get means how are you? Nobody will gonna speak one word in English, then my understanding is like how far I understand our brain work, it's from known to unknown. So speak something known and then make association with the unknown thing so that brain can memorize. Now the language is teaching process is German to German. Uh, okay, now unknown to unknown. Where my Where my knowledge or my association is working, it's like, because I understand how brain circuit work, it was so ununderstandable for me that what is we get, how I should know. Mm -hmm. I think you learn knows. a lot by context, right? For example, if you were to be taught in English, then your brain would be translating from English to German all the time. And we both know, or we all know, that wouldn't work. So I feel the one good thing about our learning languages and the first thing to say we get is, eventually by time you'd know she's possibly referring to something a greeting and i think the the act of the, that letting your brain do that you know okay i'm looking for what that could mean based on the context is how you learn a language and i think that's where most foreigners who come to countries like germany or france um because i like learning languages it's one of my hobbies and you know you're south asian we speak a lot of languages by the virtue of it it's just just people, local people speaking to you in that tongue and you pick up bits and bit pieces of it. I think that's how you would learn a language. If I were to come to a language school and a German person would greet me as, hey, how are you? I would not try and learn that language. No, I think you can crystallize the core of a culture with its language. And there is no question uh, German is one of the hardest languages to learn. And I think if you didn't grow up with it, it is really, I mean, I'm amazed how you are doing it. But um, the joke is that um, the bunch of people got together a thousand years ago, said, how do we make it on purpose? How do we make a language that nobody else can learn? And that was German. <laughs> there is a quote also from Oscar Olde, sir. Um, One life is not enough to learn the language. I, I'm living in this new voice to learn it. So, so I think uh, maybe uh, somehow I manage, but uh, I think I have full respect on the on the quote because that has something deeper meaning. Maybe German language is uh, only a metaphor because language is how our hearts connects. Maybe that I don't know, but uh, I still not remember the quote. It's a very precise, very robotic language. It is like they right. separated the the heart and the brain and just made a language for the whereas like Persian is a very poetic language like you know when you're talking is like you're just using a lot of metaphor and so on and that is by the way I think the downfall of the Persian society because everything we talk about is a poet I mean you cannot <laughs> talk in poems all the time whereas German is a like 
um, if, if two robots uh, want to communicate with each other, I think they should they definitely will use that German language. But as well, that is expression of the culture is very precise and it has a very low tolerance of putting the this garbage here versus there. I mean, what kind of damage to the environment did you do, pal, by throwing <laughs> one piece of garbage? One, the, and you got scolded for that. I think the idea that that's the only way to teach you not to do it again, to scold you for that, this is typical German, that that's okay to do it that way. You know, but, when, you, when you have a patient who's lined up to the ECG monitor, yeah. So when you speak Persian, when you speak Bangla, when you speak English, it's like, you know, the ECG graph. But when you speak German, it's flatlining. Yeah. <laughs> that is a very good observation. Is that a fact? It's not a fact. Yeah. I made it up. <laughs> it's completely made up. But because I work uh, in the media uh, and I often have to speak German and people tell me, Paul, you speak German with too much N2 and too much modulation. It doesn't <laughs> sound right. It sounds like you're biased. <laughs> it's too much emotion and and then if you watch german tv every every time i tell a foreign person how do i understand this country you should watch their tv and if you watch german television it teaches you everything you need to know about the country the pacing is slower than any tv you'd be used to um it all looks like a swedish hospital everything white and beige no colors no music simple to the point Damn, damn, damn facts, this, 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 and quite boring, if you ask me. It's not the most entertaining TV to watch. Have you looked at their humor? Have you looked at their, their, their funny, funny music, uh, the music, even the- Schlager. The, I mean, I, this is something <laughs> I just couldn't absorb. Like, I mean, they have a huge, beautiful poetry. No, no question about that. As a matter of fact, some of my best favorite uh, poetry is German poetry, but then they try to turn that poetry into music, and then they, they, I, I, I mean, they, but that's a different conversation. It seems that they, they, a robot is trying to express their love for another robot to me, and as well, the humor is a very different humor that I have myself difficulty to really absorb. Um, so t tell me about the, I mean, uh, again, my understanding, my experience is way too old. Now, when you say that TV is boring, I can I couldn't agree with that more, but ex explain to me, what do you mean by that? Go ahead. So in two words, German humor, not sufficient. So the thing is, I, I play, I'm a musician, I play in a blues band and I play with older German people. And they are funny. They will make you laugh. And the reason they do so is because they don't take life that seriously. And the younger generation, I, I think we want to talk about the younger people more, right? Because that's the future of Germany. People are afraid of being funny. Too much personality, oh, you're scaring me. Oh, you're too robust. You're wearing orange and red, that is hurting my eyes. You can wear blue, black and beige. You go to a pub and the best thing I like about England and I miss so much, you speak to anybody off the street and they will tell you a story. That's a country of storytellers. And I miss a good story in Germany. And the reason is, from what I can tell, in Germany, if you want to be a good storyteller, you have to be in control of your thoughts and your opinions. And it's a very cautious country. You show too much opinions, you are biased, you tell too many stories, you're not reliable and you make things up. If you're not fact-based, if you're not efficiently telling things the way they should, should be dry and bone dry, you're yeah. costing people's time and you're wasting it. Wow. I mean, and I think, I'm sorry to hear that it hasn't changed much since I was there. Now, let me as well tell you some personal stories. And, and well, before I tell that, I want to say about the hypocrisy and dishonesty as well there. If you do the same mistake and you look like you and me, they behave differently. If you do the same mistake and you are American or obviously American, or you are blonde from right. Sweden and so on, you get treated differently. And that, this is, that is dishonesty. I mean, I could still get, let them get away with 
if they would treat everybody the same, they don't. That's very no. clear. That, no. um, that, uh, that, that is a cultural thing that, that is a common thing that there is a, there is a group of people where inherent value is more than other group of people. And that is, um, I can tell you stories that I, when I interviewed with uh, the Professor Gelsbach in Aachen, I was, we are sitting across each other and he told me, Dr. Abbasi, you know, you have to work twice as hard to be accepted just like a German. I appreciate that honesty. But that I heard so that true. also. After 20 years also, sir, I heard that same quote. Farha, you have to work two times just to prove yourself that you are as same as a German colleague. But Maybe three times because you are female and you are in neurosurgery. That even I added. Sure. Sure. In United Thank States, you for saying that. Yeah, in United States, that would be a lawsuit right there. That would be <laughs> to say in United States. And that is why I think that is, now on, on one side, I'm appreciative that he made it clear. He put the yeah. ground for me to understand. Uh, but I, I, at least I know what I'm walking into. On the other side, that is so sad that that rule even exists. And, and then I can just tell you in 1999, when I came to uh, United States, and I admit, I went to San Francisco to Silicon Valley. I didn't go somewhere in Alabama or South Dakota at that time. I'm, I came in, I just was part of the culture. It was it was for me unfathomable to go back to Germany after that. It is when I came in, I had I had friends, I had people who I knew, who I could talk to, I people who were eager to taught me the ways, and they would uh, they, they would if I would do something that it wasn't what they were doing, they wouldn't look at it. But you are here now. You do the way we do it because everything was accepted, was, I was part of a, a, this multicultural group and so on. Now, I will admit, you cannot come to United States in everywhere and expect that, okay? So, but at least there are places, many places, most of the big cities that you can come and join and just be part of this culture. And that is truly still very unique, I believe. Yeah. But I don't believe even, you know, in most of the Europe is possible that you just come and you just join a culture from the start like that. Now, Europe is very conformist. You have to conform to every unwritten written law. And if you don't conform to like one out of 10 laws, you're out. Yeah. Now, you grew up in England, right? Right. Um, um, and so you, are, you have still the European culture that, you know, forms you. And you're talking about being in shock coming to Germany. Can you imagine for Anjum and me coming from a not European culture? I can imagine. Yeah. Now, I can tell you. And so even, uh, sorry to interrupt, sir. And even we come and jump into a medical science where the normal English is even different. So normal German will be also different because medical language is a different language. It's I have an experience there. I noticed I was working as a translator for uh, people who came as refugees and they would only speak Bangla, Pashto and doctors would sometimes not take patients because they wouldn't speak German. It was in the, you know, uh, the Gesund, uh, Krankenkasse stuff that would always, I was very at all. People Colleagues would go out to drink. All the German colleagues go out and they don't take the foreign colleagues out. How sad is that? You know, um, a new foreign colleague is left. Uh, I mean, it happens to me all the time. My German colleagues go and all the Global South people are left. And you see, I know Europe better than I think most people um, who've, you know, I have been in multiple European countries. I'm a refugee, uh, sorry, I'm an immigrant in many European countries. So it's a, it's a difficult feeling. Would I ever not be an immigrant here? I ask myself that. And, and that is hence the name of this podcast, being an eternal immigrant in Germany. It is just, 
uh, after being in Germany for 17, 18 years, I decided that is just not, I'm not going to be a German, I had German passport, but I will not be a German. Now, let me tell you some personal stories. I married a German girl. <laughs> okay. Um, her parents weren't accepting of me, but that's a different story. Let me tell you, we were in an apartment and my wife, German, just walking and just walking a little, you know, maybe stepping too hard. My neighbor downstairs came up and this was the, I opened the door. This was the exact conversation. I know you are coming from a different culture and maybe it's normal in your culture to jump up and down. And, but here in Germany, we are more, you know, the, the considerate. So please don't jump up and down. We are trying to have a nice afternoon. Now, no, no, this is my choices. I tell, no, it wasn't me. It was my German wife who did that. Or I can just swallow it and say, okay, I'm sorry. No, I, I said, I'm sorry. Okay, I won't do that anymore. But then I'm just thinking, <laughs> this is, my German wife is doing that. And I had to tell my German wife, we had to laugh out of it. Okay. Um, now, another, another personal experience. And these are just small trivialities, but that expresses the, how I felt. Um, my um, brother-in-law was American and uh, they came, that they, he, as American usually do, I'm not saying it's a good thing to do. He just turned the car on to the air conditioner to cool the car before they get in. Not saying it's a good thing. In no time, not a police officer, but they have something, a little downgrade of police officer that they're Ordnungsamt. just... Ordnungsamt. Yeah, politessen, which yeah. is, do they still have that? It's not the regular police, but they're just for traffic stuff. Uh, yeah, they're for Kerspolizei or the Ordnungsamt. They're still there. Yeah, they came and, you know, was standing there and telling my brother-in-law that it's illegal to have a car on if you're not driving in Germany. <laughs> and, and I can go on and on and on about this, you know. This... Because it's well shoots. Uh, it's like um, yeah. that uh, to like not to harm uh, with your guesses uh, the world. That's why. Right. I wish not... they were so nice to us like that to their cars. And it makes sense. Okay, I get it. It makes sense. Okay, but <laughs> I'm taking time. <laughs> <laughs> waiting on the car until my we come back and then making a point of it that it's illegal and they are going yeah, he's going to get a ticket of it is such a german thing to do now um another thing is that um, when you are living in an apartment every week somebody in the at least it used to be like that um every week Somebody who lives in that house has to is supposed to clean the stairs and so on. Yeah. Is it still yeah. like that? Yes. That's my stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no but mm -hmm. one of the people who live there every week. Another... Care worker. Yeah. Care worker, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, and if, my God, if you don't clean it properly, they are right in your face telling you how you didn't do it right and so on. Yes, so, because they have a chart which day, which number of house should clean so they can catch on that list that you, you didn't clean the window and also the stair. Yes. They love correcting people. So I cook with spices and so I used to have neighbors drop some passive aggressive notes on my door. Uh, Dear Miss Paul, I know in your country, you like to eat stinky food, but that is not what we stand up for. So I would request you to put less garlic and chili in your food next time on. That is nothing passive about it. It's just plain. <laughs> it is nothing passive about it. No, uh, but have you noticed though, when German go outside of the Germany, they're just like, they're, like they're, they're, that they're different people. It's like Mr. Jackal, Dr. Hyde, or Dr. Jackal, Mr. Hyde. They are totally different. They pride themselves of being part of a different culture and so on. They're all of a sudden open. They go and talk to people. It seems that like 
They go to Mallorca. Is it still a oh. thing going to Mallorca? Oh yeah. my God. Mallorca <laughs> is a, oh, it's a beautiful place ruined by mass tourism. By German. By German. By German mass tourism. And if it were Indians who went to Mallorca and did the same thing, dear God, the amount of hate we would get, you know, we would get. I go to Mallorca and there's this place called Bia Arenado, Bia Kernish. Yeah. It's a huge October fest like tent. You would pay money to go on a flight, go to a beautiful country like Spain, beautiful beaches, to sit inside a hut, drink overpriced beer, listen to bad German music, meet other German people who are very, very drunk. And you call that Urlaub. People actively pay money for that. And when you say Mallorca is not my game, they will say, oh, so you mean to say you don't like Germans enjoying themselves. Drunk Germans are the nicest people you meet. <laughs> The drunker they are, the nicer they are, the more open they are. But the problem is, why don't they drink at work? Why don't they drink when I take the bus? It would be a great country if it were, you know, everybody's drunk all the time. <laughs> that is very true that, you know, obviously, um, I, I would say the they somehow in their soul, they miss it. They miss this, like, being a human, be having fun, being open to other people and so on. Now, there's something I heard about the Swedish people, but I think that applies to Germans even more, that the Swedish are the most boring, most isolated people in Sweden, but they're the nicest people, more social people when they go outside of Sweden. I think that is a Nordish thing, not only Sweden, but as well applies to German. Because all the German you meet here in the United States, they're the nicest people. They are they respect you, they open up to you and so on. Or or it might be it's just a selection bias because those then they move out of Germany or go to exactly. A, I don't know which one it is. But I, I I think if they move out to places like the USA, Germans love America. Yeah. Because you know they're still living under this feeling, you know, they liberated us back after the war and it's a cool culture. German students who go to America, Australia, countries like these for one month, come back with an American accent or an Australian accent. Yeah, yeah. And I've always wondered how that is. So I asked them, you were there for four weeks. How do you have a, you know, a West Coast accent now? And the logical explanation always is, you know, I spoke to so many people. I was so outgoing. I was partying all the time uh, that I developed an accent. I'm not sure that's how it works. Oh, I, I'm afraid to say they don't look at America as liberators. German, they just love strength. They yeah. abhor weakness. And they see global thought as weak. Like, yeah. I was in, in the university. These are smart people. These are future doctors. These are academics. They contribute. They said the global thought. They were especially talking about Africa. But they were thinking... They had, there is an inherent flaw in the brain structure and the culture of the African. That is why they are weak. Not because Europe has raped Africa for, uh, for eternity. Not because we never let them develop it, we, uh, develop themselves and so on. But they thought, uh, and again, these are not dumb people. These are not you know, the, the people who just uh, having had a good education and they had no excuse not to understand that this intricate intercoming of what made like global thought, global thought, uh, thought. And they thought it is a flaw and they deserve what they deserve. They look at America, not because we liberated them, but because we came strong and we yeah. showed them what they cannot do. And German, if anything, they respect strength. They respect Way true. when when they respect when they're beaten. They understand. Now there is a joke about the. Uh, I mean, uh, the German that uh, they um, they uh, they hosted uh, two world wars. Okay, they they wanted to be strong, and once they they were beaten, they submitted. And that is, uh, I'm hoping, you know, the German culture changes enough to understand that they, they're, they're more than you know, being strong. And it's not like 
this hierarchy of U.S. Like even now, German politics is a slave to American politics. Like they follow America no matter what shitty thing we do. They just follow us. Um, and But that's a different conversation. Now, I like to know we are almost an hour um, in our conversation. I want to um, finish this on a positive note because my kids are German. At home, I speak German. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that my kids will grow up in a different... And you gave me some hope here. Oh, you gave me some hope yeah. that... Many of these things uh, eventually will go away. And tell me about some positive experiences that you have made in Germany. Because at the end of the day, you know, we decided to go to their country. <laughs> so it, uh, it has something for us. So go ahead. What do you see as a journalist, especially as a journalist? What do you see the future of Germany and the, the integration, what, let me start. What I see as a future of Germany and Europe is that Germany is the backbone of European Union. And they take a lots of, you know, they take a lots of, they pay a lots of bills for European Union to exist. And I think just the fact that uh, this European Union, and I'm very sorry to see that England uh, is not part of it, I think the future of Germany is the future of Europe. And I think, as you said, these old people will die out and the young people will grow up with a different culture. But I want to hear from both of you on a positive note. What can we hope for? There's a lot to be hopeful about. I mean, if Germany sneezes, the entire Europe says Gesundheit. Because Germany is the strongest economy in Europe, without a doubt. And Germany needs to be strong at this point with the Ukraine-Russia war going on, with everything, with whoever comes to power, Trump or Kamala, whatever happens in Sudan, what could happen in Lebanon and the, you know, the, the crisis going on in the Middle East right now. Germany is supporting all of these things financially, economically, and with their technology. A lot of criti critiques would say a lot of things, delivering weapons, we're not going there. What is changing in Germany um, as an immigrant, what I can tell, the far right is getting strong, but people who criticize the far right are also getting strong. So there are a lot of people who say, and especially a lot of immigrants who now get the German passport easily, now become naturalized citizens, fight for our rights. So a German government made it easier for German citizens or sorry, immigrants who've stayed here for a while. They're adding, you know, to the economy. They've made it easier for them to get the German passport. And that means when these people get the German passport, they can lobby for the rights of people who come here. And Germany has learned from its past mistakes that if you want integration, a successful integration, not assimilation, people get to keep some part of their cultural life and people integrate just enough so the society functions and still remains vibrant. It has to be a two-way road. It's not just me learning the language and showing up for work. It's the person, it's the German government making it possible for me to integrate. And they are doing it. You see a lot of stuff happen there. And personally, I too, like you, have a German partner who I really dearly love. And I am in this country for them. And I might have children who would be half German and half Indian, and I want them to grow up thinking I am German because I am living in Germany. And lots of, uh, if, even if you look at the statistics, lots of mixed marriages are happening. Mixed kids are growing up. German schools are very, very mixed, very diverse. And society doesn't look like it used to look perhaps when you left. And it's a good thing. People hire not only because of diversity quotas, because you need regionalization. You need people representing different cultures. Um, especially as a journalist, I see people want me for my skills and not because I look a certain way. And that Germany does better than any other country in the world. It hires for your talent, not because where you came from. Well, that is, you know, it's something that we all can be hopeful for. And I think the future of Germany as well depend on it. Because, uh, you know, uh, there is a reason America is this strong. I grew up in Iran. I 
educated in Germany and I brought all my talent to United States. Germany needs that for talented people to come there, but you have to give those people a reason to stay. Exactly. Thank you for describing. Thank you so much for this observation. Anjum, tell me about, tell me something positive, please. <laughs> about Germany. <laughs> I will again follow my mentor and follow my boss. So I will pull your thread that give me some reason to breathe, give me some reason to leave. Yeah. Um, don't be so harsh on our language, our accent. We all are doctors. We are qualified. We go through a lot of our life and that's how we learn responsibility. It is nothing what we have to learn at least at this age. So there is uh, like that. I also want to use a quote very strong use in Indian language. I will translate it for all general people. Geo or Ginedo. That means leave and let the people leave. That mm -hmm. quote I want to give to um, the German next generation. Uh, I am also very hopeful um, about Germany. Um, I can say that uh, because of my profession, maybe I'm very focused on learning, training, and integration in uh, my medical academic side. So I have less possible or chance to get out or to hang out or to check the bars because I have 24 hours duty or 12 hours. Uh, <laughs> so the thing is, um, I learn to be very punctual, I learn the strength of my word and my voice and my body language. I think I was not aware that my position is holding a very much powerful uh, authority. And German medical system show me that, yes, I keep you so tight and I will also value you if you also value the system. And I have hope that it is a so trained and disciplined system. If once get in, there is a smooth way. There is no rotten and rusted way that someone will get lost. It is only one choice if I want to go this way or that way. But the pipe is still now so clean that you can drink the water from your water supply. That's how the smooth is the medical system and the training. And it also um, a country to build, um, I think, the civilization or like very good social skill, norm, culture to keep a distance when you're walking or to, or to talk in a certain voice that don't hamper someone else's privacy. Or I think there are a lot to learn from this nation, but one should um let them free to learn because if you keep the air pipe tight if one can breathe then the thought is only for survive and in the survival process nobody can learn there is no harm to be asylum or to be migrated and showing them hey your uh, learning curve is so low or so down let them leave first this is our birthright so on top of everything uh, I think this nation has a view and they are opening up and welcoming uh, different um, nationalities and different skin color people in different sector. Um, uh, so that makes some hope. And I think that um, that people should take only the positive thing. However, is bad the situation. After a while, it will be good. Or we will just know how to survive with that. Anyway. Well, thank you so much. I know how personal all this has been to be to both of you. Um, I think uh, we talked about um, our own experiences, which I do believe it's reflective. And I, I'm still staying with the positive note that things are changing. Um, this has been a great podcast. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being here. On behalf of, uh, you know, Essence podcast, I thank you both. And this is Dr. Abbasi for Essence. And our special guest, please introduce yourself one more time for the end of the podcast. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Hamid Abbasi. I am Dr. Farhan Jew, neurosurgery resident in Germany. Give me the privilege to talk um, how is my journey in Germany. Thank you very much for the privilege. Thank you, Dr. Abbasi, Dr. Anjum. I am not a doctor, but I come from the land of great bread, great beer, great cars, and very mediocre humor. And I'm quite happy being here. And I'm sure it's just going to get better from here. If you're new in Germany, don't give up. Fill out your forms. Learn the language. Go to Ausländer Behörde. Don't wear too many colors. And if you're too upset, go to the pub. Thank you very much. Goodbye for us.